Notes from the Underground by Fyodor Dostoevsky Part 2 Chapter 5 So this is it. This is it at last. Contact with real life, I muttered as I ran headlong downstairs. This is very different from the Pope's leaving Rome and going to Brazil. Very different from the ball on Lake Como. You are a scoundrel, a thought flashed through my mind, if you laugh at this now. No matter, I cried, answering myself. Not everything is lost. There was no trace to be seen of them, but that made no difference. I knew where they had gone. At the steps was standing a solitary night sledge-driver, in a rough peasant coat, powdered over with the still-falling wet and, as it were, warm snow. It was hot and steamy. The little shaggy piebald horse was also covered with snow and coughing. I remember that very well. I made a rush for the roughly made sledge, but as soon as I raised my foot to get into it, the recollection of how Simonov had just given me six roubles seemed to double me up, and I tumbled into the sledge like a sack. No, I must do a great deal to make up for all that, I cried. But I will make up for it, or perish on the spot this very night. Start! We set off. There was a perfect whirl in my head. They won't go down on their knees to beg for my friendship. That is a mirage. Cheap mirage. Revolting, romantic, and fantastical. That's another ball on Lake Como. And so I am bound to slap Zverkov's face. It is my duty to. And so it is settled. I am flying to give him a slap in the face. Hurry up! The driver tugged at the reins. As soon as I go in, I'll give it him. Ought I, before giving him the slap, to say a few words by way of preface? No. I'll simply go in and give it him. They will all be sitting in the drawing-room, and he with Olympia on the sofa, that damned Olympia. She laughed at my looks on one occasion and refused me. I'll pull Olympia's hair, pull Zverkov's ear. No. Better one ear, and pull him by it around the room. Maybe they will all begin beating me, and will kick me out. That's most likely, indeed. No matter. Anyway, I shall first slap him. The initiative will be mine, and by the laws of honor that is everything. He will be branded, and cannot wipe off the slap by any blows, by nothing but a duel. He will be forced to fight. And let them beat me now. Let them, the ungrateful wretches. Trudulyabov will beat me the hardest. He is so strong. Ferfitchkin will be sure to catch hold sideways and tug at my hair. But no matter, no matter. That's what I am going for. The blockheads will be forced at last to see the tragedy of it all. When they drag me to the door, I shall call out to them that, in reality, they are not worth my little finger. "'Get on, driver! Get on!' I cried to the driver. He started and flicked his whip. I shouted so savagely. "'We shall fight at daybreak. That's a settled thing. I've done with the office. Fair Fitchkin made a joke about it just now. But where can I get pistols? Nonsense! I'll get my salary in advance and buy them. And powder and bullets? That's the second's business.' And how can it all be done by daybreak? And where am I to get a second? I have no friends. Nonsense, I cried, lashing myself up more and more. It's of no consequence. The first person I meet in the street is bound to be my second, just as he would be bound to pull a drowning man out of water. The most eccentric things may happen. Even if I were to ask the director himself to be my second tomorrow, he would be bound to consent, if only from a feeling of chivalry and to keep the secret. Anton Antonitch. The fact is that at that very minute the disgusting absurdity of my plan, and the other side of the question, was clearer and more vivid to my imagination than it could be to anyone on earth. But— Get on, driver! Get on, you rascal! Get on! Ugh, sir, said the son of toil. Cold shivers suddenly ran down me. Wouldn't it be better to go straight home? My God, my God! 
Why did I invite myself to this dinner yesterday? But no, it's impossible. And my walking up and down for three hours from the table to the stove? No, they, they and no one else must pay for my walking up and down. They must wipe out this dishonor. Drive on! And what if they give me into custody? Well, they wouldn't dare. They'll be afraid of the scandal. And what if Zverkov is so contemptuous that he refuses to fight a duel? He is sure to. But in that case I'll show them. I will turn up at the posting station when he's setting off tomorrow. I'll catch him by the leg. I'll pull off his coat when he gets into the carriage. I'll get my teeth into his hand. I'll bite him. See what lengths you can drive a desperate man to? He may hit me on the head, and they may belabor me from behind. I will shout to the assembled multitude, Look at this young puppy who is driving off to captivate the Circassian girls after letting me spit in his face. Of course, after that everything will be over. The office will have vanished off the face of the earth. I shall be arrested, I shall be tried, I shall be dismissed from the service, thrown in prison, sent to Siberia. Never mind. In fifteen years, when they let me out of prison, I will trudge off to him, a beggar, in rags. I shall find him in some provincial town. He will be married and happy. He will have a grown-up daughter. I shall say to him, Look, monster, at my hollow cheeks and my rags. I've lost everything. My career, my happiness, art, science, the woman I loved, and all through you. Here are the pistols. I have come to discharge my pistol, and... and I... forgive you. Then I shall fire into the air and he will hear nothing more of me. I was actually on the point of tears, though I knew perfectly well at that moment that all this was out of Pushkin's Silvio and Lermontov's masquerade. And all at once I felt horribly ashamed, so ashamed that I stopped the horse, got out of the sledge, and stood still in the snow in the middle of the street. The driver gazed at me, sighing and astonished. What was I to do? I could not go on there. It was evidently stupid, and I could not leave things as they were, because that would seem as though— Heavens! How could I leave things? And after such insults— No! I cried, throwing myself into the sledge again. It is ordained! It is fate! Drive on! Drive on! And in my impatience I— punched the sledge-driver on the back of the neck. "'What are you up to? What are you hitting me for?' the peasant shouted. But he whipped up his nag so that it began kicking. The wet snow was falling in big flakes. I unbuttoned myself regardless of it. I forgot everything else, for I had finally decided on the slap, and felt with horror that it was going to happen now, at once and that no force could stop it. The deserted street lamps gleamed sullenly in the snowy darkness like torches at a funeral. The snow drifted under my greatcoat, under my coat, under my cravat, and melted there. I did not wrap myself up. All was lost anyway. At last we arrived. I jumped out, almost unconscious ran up the steps and began knocking and kicking at the door. I felt fearfully weak, particularly in my legs and knees. The door was opened quickly, as though they knew I was coming. As a fact, Simonov had warned them that perhaps another gentleman would arrive, and this was a place in which one had to give notice and to observe certain precautions. It was one of those millinery establishments which were abolished by the police a good time ago. By day it really was a shop, but at night, if one had an introduction, one might visit it for other purposes. I walked rapidly through the dark shop into the familiar drawing-room, where there was only one candle burning, and stood still in amazement. 
There was no one there. Where are they? I asked somebody. But by now, of course, they had separated. Before me was standing a person with a stupid smile, the madam herself, who had seen me before. A minute later a door opened and another person came in. Taking no notice of anything, I strode about the room, and, I believe, I talked to myself. I felt as though I had been saved from death, and was conscious of this, joyfully all over. I should have given that slap. I should certainly, certainly have given it. But now they were not here, and everything had vanished and changed. I looked round. I could not realize my condition yet. I looked mechanically at the girl who had come in, and had a glimpse of a fresh, young, rather pale face, with straight, dark eyebrows, and with grave, as it were, wondering eyes that attracted me at once. I should have hated her if she had been smiling. I began looking at her more intently, and, as it were, with effort. I had not fully collected my thoughts. There was something simple and good-natured in her face, but something strangely grave. I am sure that this stood in her way here, and none of those fools had noticed her. She could not, however, have been called a beauty, though she was tall, strong-looking, and well-built. She was very simply dressed. Something loathsome stirred within me. I went straight up to her. I chanced to look into the glass. My harassed face struck me as revolting in the extreme, pale, angry, abject, with disheveled hair. No matter. I am glad of it, I thought. I am glad that I shall seem repulsive to her. I like that. Notes from the Underground by Fyodor Dostoevsky Part 2 Chapter 6 Somewhere behind a screen a clock began wheezing, as though oppressed by something, as though someone were strangling it. After an unnaturally prolonged wheezing there followed a shrill, nasty, and as it were, unexpectedly rapid chime, as though someone were suddenly jumping forward. It struck two. I woke up, though I had indeed not been asleep, but lying half-conscious. It was almost completely dark in the narrow, cramped, low-pitched room, cumbered up with an enormous wardrobe and piles of cardboard boxes and all sorts of frippery and litter. The candle-end that had been burning on the table was going out and gave a faint flicker from time to time. In a few minutes there would be complete darkness. I was not long in coming to myself. Everything came back to my mind at once, without an effort, as though it had been in ambush to pounce upon me again. And indeed, even while I was unconscious, a point seemed continually to remain in my memory unforgotten, and round it my dreams moved drearily. But strange to say, everything that had happened to me in that day seemed to me now, on waking, to be in the far, far away past, as though I had long, long ago lived all that down. My head was full of fumes. Something seemed to be hovering over me, rousing me, exciting me, and making me restless. Misery and spite seemed surging up in me again, and seeking an outlet. Suddenly I saw beside me two wide-open eyes, scrutinizing me curiously and persistently. The look in those eyes was coldly detached, sullen, as it were utterly remote. It weighed upon me. A grim idea came into my brain and passed all over my body as a horrible sensation, such as one feels when one goes into a damp and moldy cellar. There was something unnatural in those two eyes, beginning to look at me only now. I recalled, too, that during those two hours I had not said a single word to this creature, and had, in fact, considered it utterly superfluous. In fact, the silence had, for some reason, gratified me. Now I suddenly realized vividly the hideous idea 
revolting as a spider, of vice, which without love, grossly and shamelessly begins with that in which true love finds its consummation. For a long time we gazed at each other like that. But she did not drop her eyes before mine, and her expression did not change, so that at last I felt uncomfortable. "'What is your name?' I asked abruptly, to put an end to it. "'Lisa,' she answered, almost in a whisper, but somehow far from graciously. She turned her eyes away. I was silent. "'What weather! The snow! It's disgusting!' I said, almost to myself, putting my arm under my head despondently and gazing at the ceiling. She made no answer. This was horrible. "'Have you always lived in Petersburg?' I asked a minute later, almost angrily, turning my head slightly towards her. "'No.' Where do you come from? From Riga, she answered reluctantly. Are you a German? No, Russian. Have you been here long? Where? In this house. A fortnight. She spoke more and more jerkily. The candle went out. I could no longer distinguish her face. Have you a father and mother? Yes. No. I have. Where are they? There, in Riga. What are they? Oh, nothing. Nothing? Why, what class are they? Tradespeople. Have you always lived with them? Yes. How old are you? Twenty. Why did you leave them? Oh, for no reason. That answer meant, let me alone, I feel sick, sad. We were silent. God knows why I did not go away. I felt myself more and more sick and dreary. The images of the previous day began, of themselves, apart from my will, flitting through my memory in confusion. I suddenly recalled something I had seen that morning when, full of anxious thoughts, I was hurrying to the office. I saw them carrying a coffin out yesterday, and they nearly dropped it. I suddenly said aloud, not that I desired to open the conversation, but, as it were, by accident. A coffin? Yes, in the hay market. They were bringing it up out of a cellar. From a cellar? Not from a cellar, but a basement. Though, you know, dead down below, from a house of ill fame. It was filthy all around. Eggshells, litter, a stench. It was loathsome. Silence. A nasty day to be buried, I began, simply to avoid being silent. Nasty in what way? The snow, the wet, I yawned. It makes no difference, she said suddenly after a brief silence. No, it's horrid, I yawned again. The grave diggers must have sworn at getting drenched by the snow. There must have been water in the grave. Why water in the grave? she asked, with a sort of curiosity, but speaking even more harshly and abruptly than before. I suddenly began to feel provoked. Why, there must have been water at the bottom, a foot deep. You can't dig a dry grave in Volkovo Cemetery. Why? 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 The place is waterlogged. It's a regular marsh. So they bury them in water. I've seen it myself many times. I had never seen it once. Indeed, I had never been in Volkovo, and had only heard stories of it. Do you mean to say you don't mind how you die? But why should I die? she answered, as though defending herself. Why, some day you will die, and you will die just the same as that dead woman. She was a girl like you. She died of consumption. A wench would have died in hospital. She knows all about it already. She said wench, not girl. She was in debt to her, madam, I retorted more and more provoked by the discussion. 
and went on earning money for her up to the end, though she was in consumption. Some sledge-drivers standing by were talking about her to some soldiers and telling them so. No doubt they knew her. They were laughing. They were going to meet in a pot-house to drink to her memory. A great deal of this was my invention. Silence followed, profound silence. She did not stir. And is it better to die in a hospital? Isn't it just the same? Besides, why should I die? she added irritably. If not now, a little later. Why a little later? Why, indeed. Now you are young, pretty, fresh. You fetch a high price. But after another year of this life you will be very different. You will go off. In a year? Anyway, in a year you will be worth less. I continued malignantly. You will go from here to something lower. Another house. A year later, to a third. Lower and lower. And in seven years you will come to a basement in the hay market. That will be if you were lucky. But it would be much worse if you got some disease. Consumption, say. And caught a chill, or something or other. It's not easy to get over an illness in your way of life. If you catch anything, you may not get rid of it. And so you would die. Oh, well, then... I shall die, she answered quite vindictively. She made a quick movement. But one is sorry. Sorry for whom? Sorry for life. Silence. Have you been engaged to be married, eh? What's that to you? Oh, I'm not cross-examining you. It's nothing to me. Why are you so cross? Of course, you may have had your own troubles. What is it to me? It's simply that I have felt... Sorry. Sorry for whom? Sorry for you. No need, she whispered hardly audibly, and again made a faint movement. That incensed me at once. What? I was so gentle with her, and she— Why, do you think that you are on the right path? I don't think anything. That's what's wrong. That you don't think. Realize it while there is still time. There still is time. You are still young, good-looking. You might love, be married, be happy. Not all married women are happy, she snapped out in the rude, abrupt tone she had used at first. Not all, of course, but anyway it is much better than the life here, infinitely better. Besides, with love one can live even without happiness, even in sorrow. Life is sweet. Life is sweet, however one lives. But here, what is there but foulness? Phew! I turned away with disgust. I was no longer reasoning coldly. I began to feel myself what I was saying, and warmed to the subject. I was already longing to expound the cherished ideas I had brooded over in my corner. Something suddenly flared up in me. An object had appeared before me. Never mind my being here. I am not an example for you. I am, perhaps, worse than you are. I was drunk when I came here, though. I hastened, however, to say, in self-defense, Besides, a man is no example for a woman. It's a different thing. I may degrade and defile myself, but I am not anyone's slave. I come and go, and that's an end of it. I shake it off, and I am a different man. But you— are a slave from the start. Yes, a slave. You give up everything, your whole freedom. If you want to break your chains afterwards, you won't be able to. You will be more and more fast in the snares. It is an accursed bondage. I know it. I won't speak of anything else. Maybe you won't understand, but tell me. No doubt you are in debt to your madam. There, you see? I added, though... She made no answer, but only listened in silence, entirely absorbed. That's a bondage for you. You will never buy your freedom. They will see to that. It's like selling your soul to the devil. And besides, perhaps I, too, am just as unlucky. How do you know? And wallow in the mud on purpose, out of misery. You know, men take to drink from grief. Well, maybe I am here from grief. Come, 
Tell me, what is there good here? Here you and I came together, just now, and did not say one word to one another all the time, and it was only afterwards you began staring at me like a wild creature, and I at you. Is that loving? Is that how one human being should meet another? It's hideous, that's what it is. Yes, she assented sharply and hurriedly. I was positively astounded by the promptitude of this yes. So the same thought may have been straying through her mind when she was staring at me just before. So she, too, was capable of certain thoughts. Damn it all, this was interesting. This was a point of likeness, I thought, almost rubbing my hands. And indeed it's easy to turn a young soul like that. It was the exercise of my power that attracted me most. She turned her head nearer to me, and it seemed to me in the darkness that she propped herself on her arm. Perhaps she was scrutinizing me. How I regretted that I could not see her eyes. I heard her deep breathing. Why have you come here? I asked her, with a note of authority already in my voice. Oh, I don't know. But how nice it would be to be living in your father's house. It's warm and free. You have a home of your own. But what if it's worse than this? I must take the right tone, flashed through my mind. I may not get far with sentimentality. But it was only a momentary thought. I swear she really did interest me. Besides, I was exhausted and moody. And cunning so easily goes hand in hand with feeling. Who denies it? I hasten to answer. Anything may happen. I am convinced that someone has wronged you, and that you are more sinned against than sinning. Of course I know nothing of your story, but it's not likely a girl like you has come here of her own inclination. A girl like me? She whispered, hardly audibly, but I heard it. Damn it all, I was flattering her. That was horrid. Perhaps it was a good thing. She was silent. See, Lisa, I will tell you about myself. If I had had a home from childhood, I shouldn't be what I am now. I often think that. However bad it may be at home, anyway they are your father and mother, and not enemies, strangers. Once a year at least, They'll show their love of you. Anyway, you know you are at home. I grew up without a home. And perhaps that's why I've turned so unfeeling. I waited again. Perhaps she doesn't understand, I thought. And, indeed, it is absurd. It's moralizing. If I were a father and had a daughter... I believe I should love my daughter more than my sons. Really. I began indirectly, as though talking of something else to distract her attention. I must confess I blushed. Why so? she asked. Ah, so she was listening. I don't know, Lisa. I knew a father who was a stern, austere man, but used to go down on his knees to his daughter used to kiss her hands, her feet. He couldn't make enough of her, really. When she danced at parties, he used to stand for five hours at a stretch gazing at her. He was mad over her. I understand that. She would fall asleep tired at night, and he would wake to kiss her in her sleep and make the sign of the cross over her. He would go about in a dirty old coat. He was stingy to everyone else, but would spend his last penny for her giving her expensive presents. And it was his greatest delight when she was pleased with what he gave her. Fathers always love their daughters more than the mothers do. Some girls live happily at home, and I believe I should never let my daughters marry. What next? she said with a faint smile. I should be jealous. I really should, to think that she should kiss anyone else. 
that she should love a stranger more than her father. It's painful to imagine it. Of course that's all nonsense. Of course every father would be reasonable at last. But I believe before I should let her marry, I should worry myself to death. I should find fault with all her suitors. But I should end by letting her marry whom she herself loved. The one whom the daughter loves always seems the worst to the father, you know. That is always so. So many family troubles come from that. Some are glad to sell their daughters, rather than marrying them honorably. Ah, so that was it. Such a thing, Lisa, happens in those accursed families in which there is neither love nor God, I retorted warmly. And where there is no love, there is no sense, either. There are such families, it's true. But I am not speaking of them. You must have seen wickedness in your own family, if you talk like that. Truly, you must have been unlucky. Hmm. That sort of thing mostly comes through poverty. And is it any better with the gentry? even among the poor, honest people who live happily? Hmm, yes, perhaps. Another thing, Lisa. Man is fond of reckoning up his troubles, but does not count his joys. If he counted them up as he ought, he would see that every lot has enough happiness provided for it. And what if all goes well with the family, if the blessing of God is upon it, if the husband is a good one, loves you, cherishes you, never leaves you. There is happiness in such a family. Even sometimes there is happiness in the midst of sorrow, and indeed sorrow is everywhere. If you marry, you will find out for yourself. But think of the first years of married life with one you love. What happiness! What happiness there sometimes is in it! And indeed it's the ordinary thing. In those early days, even quarrels with one's husband end happily. Some women get up quarrels with their husbands just because they love them. Indeed, I knew a woman like that. She seemed to say that because she loved him. She would torment him and make him feel it. You know that you may torment a man on purpose through love. Women are particularly given to that, thinking to themselves, I will love him so, I will make so much of him afterwards, that it's no sin to torment him a little now. And all in the house rejoice in the sight of you, and you are happy and gay and peaceful and honorable. Then there are some women who are jealous, if he went off anywhere. I knew one such woman, she couldn't restrain herself, but would jump up at night and run off on the sly to find out where he was, whether he was with some other woman. That's a pity. And the woman knows herself it's wrong, and her heart fails her, and she suffers, but she loves. It's all through love, and how sweet it is to make up after quarrels, to own herself in the wrong, or to forgive him. And they both are so happy all at once as though they had met anew, been married over again, as though their love had begun afresh. And no one, no one should know what passes between husband and wife if they love one another, and whatever quarrels there may be between them, they ought not to call in their own mother to judge between them and tell tales of one another. They are their own judges. Love is a holy mystery, and ought to be hidden from all other eyes, whatever happens. That makes it holier and better. They respect one another more, and much is built on respect. And if once there has been love, and if they have been married for love, why should love pass away? Surely one can keep it. It is rare that one cannot keep it. And if the husband is kind and straightforward, why should not love last? The first phase of married love will pass, it is true. But then there will come a love that is better still. Then there will be the union of souls. They will have everything in common. There will be no secrets between them. And once they have children, the most difficult times will seem to them happy. So long as there is love and courage, even toil will be a joy. 
you may deny yourself bread for your children, and even that will be a joy. They will love you for it afterwards. So you are laying by for your future. As the children grow up, you feel that you are an example, a support for them, that even after you die your children will always keep your thoughts and feelings, because they have received them from you. They will take on your semblance and likeness. So you see that this is a great duty. How can it fail to draw the father and mother nearer? People say it's a trial to have children. Who says that? It is heavenly happiness. Are you fond of little children, Lisa? I am awfully fond of them. You know, a little rosy baby boy at your bosom. And what husband's heart is not touched, seeing his wife nursing his child? A plump little rosy baby, sprawling and snuggling, chubby little hands and feet, clean, tiny little nails, so tiny that it makes one laugh to look at them, eyes that look as if they understand everything. And while it sucks, it clutches at your bosom with its little hand, plays. When its father comes up, the child tears itself away from the bosom, flings itself back, looks at its father, laughs, as though it were fearfully funny, and falls to sucking again. Or it will bite its mother breast when its little teeth are coming, while it looks sideways at her with its little eyes as though to say, Look, I am biting. Is not all that happiness when they are the three together, husband, wife, and child? One can forgive a great deal for the sake of such moments. Yes, Lisa, one must first learn to live oneself before one blames others. It's by pictures. Pictures like that one must get at you. I thought to myself, though I did speak with real feeling, and all at once I flushed crimson. What if she were suddenly to burst out laughing? What should I do then? That idea drove me to fury. Towards the end of my speech I really was excited. And now my vanity was somehow wounded. The silence continued. I almost nudged her. Why are you... she began and stopped. But I understood. There was a quiver of something different in her voice, not abrupt, harsh and unyielding as before, but something soft and shamefaced, so shamefaced that I suddenly felt ashamed and guilty. What? I asked, with tender curiosity. Why? You... What? Why you speak somehow like a book, she said, and again there was a note of irony in her voice. That remark sent a pang to my heart. It was not what I was expecting. I did not understand that she was hiding her feelings under irony, that this is usually the last refuge of modest and chaste-souled people when the privacy of their soul is coarsely and intrusively invaded, and that their pride makes them refuse to surrender till the last moment and shrink from giving expression to their feelings before you, I ought to have guessed the truth from the timidity with which she had repeatedly approached her sarcasm, only bringing herself to utter it at last with an effort. But I did not guess, and an evil feeling took possession of me. Wait a bit, I thought. End of Part 2 Chapter 6